<clears throat> a few slides that for many are the first impression of uh, Iceland. Uh, and these photos are actually taken in the hallway that goes from the airplane in at the Icelandic International Airport toward the duty free and package section. And this is rather long and narrow hallway, like some of you have probably seen, linking these two spaces. And it is always decorated with rather large and elaborate posters promoting various Icelandic products, mm -hmm. but also featuring images of the country and its inhabitants. I see, for example, an uh, Icelandic family looking hopefully into the future, promoting Icelandic skier. Uh, and then a smiling woman with her body half covered uh, in the blue lagoon, bidding me welcome. And even though these advertisements, uh, they have of course changed during the years, even though many seem to stay the same for a long time, especially one uh, from the blue lagoon. But in general, they project a quite coherent emphasis on Iceland as a place. The Icelandic bodies visually displayed in these ads they have, uh, for the last few years, very strongly emphasized white bodies and take a such part in the increased reification of Icelandic identities as white identities that have been especially important in the booming tourism industry and nation branding of Iceland. So in my talk, I want to uh, stress the necessity of acknowledging racism when we talk about diversity. I'm notably not so much addressing here the hateful rhetoric regarding migrants and people seen as immigrants, but more stressing like Vishante did in her talk, these kind of everyday uh, uh, conceptions and the need to recognize different forms of racialization, the ways that people are uh, categorized into this uh, social construction that race is, and the underlying assumptions that are important in shaping general discussions about diversity and migration in Europe. Uh, the massive mobilization against racism across Europe in 2020 should re have reminded everyone that racism should, shouldn't be seen as exception in the European context. And I'm going to reflect on these issues uh, generally, but also as asked by the organizers to give some indication uh, of understanding of diversity in the Icelandic context and how these issues uh, play out there. First of all, I want to stress a little further the importance of not limiting our critical perspective to outspoken hateful racist acts and speech. Of course, that kind of research is quite necessary, unfortunately, as well, but to make evident the different processes of racialization that take part in naturalizing race and assigning particular types of bodies to specific uh, spaces. And as my opening remark reflect, the image of Iceland has, for example, become strongly commercialized. And this is not surprising at times when commercialization and consumptions have become crucial sites where ideas of identity, gender, race, ethnicities are reproduced and reconstructed. So we have to ask critically, how does this commercialization create and reconfigure links of particular bodies to particular spaces, or even create a point of identification for people that are racialized in different ways? How do people learn to recognize themselves within a deeply hierarchical system? And then I'm not only speaking of those who are racialized as black or non-white in different ways, but also those who have learned to recognize themselves as being white. Where part of the privileges of being white, as I assume all of you know here, is not to recognize whiteness as a part of racial system or having to think of oneself as such. And here it is necessary to remember that this commercialization of whiteness in European countries like Iceland takes place in the same world as the criminalization of precarious racialized migrants. 
my interlocutors in a research that I did a few years back in Belgium and to minor extent in Italy on precarious irregular migrants from Niger in West Africa uh, are one of those that often feel less than welcome in Europe, being black Muslim men, often coming from areas of intense uh, conflict from Libya and almost always from poverty. So the question, what are these uh, people doing here is not only voiced by populist leaders, but also problematized by various security regimes within Europe, as you saw from the image of front, from Frontex on the earlier slide, uh, in political speeches, and then through institutions such as Frontex that take part in portraying this migration as an invasion, as threat or security problem. And here I want to stress uh, that it is important to remember how particular mobilities are made precarious by various institutional frameworks and structural conditions. Uh, mobilities of other people are not as uh, precarious as we see with various privileged mobilities. The second issue that I wanted to mention relates uh, to an understanding of the interplay between such a global racializing discourse and racist discourse and practices and the transplantation of racism at particular localities. In Iceland, for example, it is quite difficult to understand racism historically if not a lot acknowledging how discussion about racial differences are shaped by Iceland's own position as under Danish rule until 1944. So this emphasis on the particularities of racism in specific places are, however, always tricky because as critical scholars have repeatedly pointed out in relation to the Nordic countries, for example, racism is so often defended on the premises that it's different here. And I've seen this so many times in Iceland. So focusing on the particularities of racism in certain places can thus run the risk of relativizing racism and reproduce persistent national arguments of exception. Lars Jensen and I, we have talked about in an edited volume that came out several years ago on Nordic exceptionalism, how the notion that the Nordic countries exist outside colonial histories has functioned as a denial that there can be racism in the Nordic countries today. And we, of course, uh, do not exist in a world where there are in prior localities or untouched locals. Rather, different localities, such as Iceland, are already shaped by coloniality, by racist histories, and various transnational institutional agreements that often have uh, racist consequences. So if we reflect on these issues briefly in the context of Iceland and diversity in recent past, <coughs> the emphasis on white bodies in the airport takes also notably a place at the same time as Iceland has become much more diversified in terms of people's origin. So today, uh, about 70% of the population are born elsewhere which is a rather sudden change from foreign-born population being 2% in 83 and then 8% in 2011. And of course, there are uh, also uh, what is sometimes called second generation of uh, immigrants, uh, children that are, are born or adults that are born in Iceland. These numbers are also much uh, higher. Uh, not all of these are, of course, migrants in precarious situation. And within this population, there is an intersection of country or origin, class, uh, and other uh, aspects, which gives uh, different individuals different status and possibilities in Icelandic society. And there is a very clear hierarchy of uh, migrants. In the late 2000s, Iceland became a part of the wider European labor market, leading to then unprecedented migration to Iceland, especially from the eastern part of Europe. The great majority of migrants have come from Poland, with Lithuanians as the second largest 
group, but still uh, not close to the number of people from Poland. Uh, at the time in the uh, late 2000, there, or in, in the 2000, there was an economic boom in Iceland with plenty of job opportunities, where the lowest filling jobs were filled with overqualified individuals uh, from these countries and other parts of Europe that were leaving behind unemployment and low salaries. And it was alarming how quickly in the context of this labor migration, negative discussion rose in Iceland regarding especially people from Poland and Lithuania as a threat to Icelandic culture, where people from these countries were portrayed as a different kind of Europeans, a discourse that was quite often quite uh, racialized and gendered. And what is salient here and alarming is that these kind of depictions of people from uh, different Eastern European countries circulating, uh, oh, I'm sorry, these kind of depictions of Lithuanians and Polish people had no prior history in Europe, but they seem to be mobilizing depiction of Eastern Europe circulating historically more widely in West Europe, where Eastern uh, people from Eastern part of Europe have very often been portrayed uh, as underdeveloped or un immature European subjects, Atasse Senovska has critically phrased it. So in this case, we see the flexibility and mobility of certain racist ideas and how they became become activated within particular circumstances, where people from particular nationalities were becoming an economic underclass. As phrased by John Fox at all, talking about the UK, the racialization of migration from Eastern part of Europe in the context of the enlargement of the EU reflects how the idea of race has continued currency to make sense of migration. In Iceland as elsewhere, cultural diversity continues to be one of the important ways of making sense of diversity in general. As my discussion on people from Poland and Lithuania indicates, reference to culture has become one way of expressing racism in the present, where culture is usually seen in the everyday discussion as something that other people have and that controls the behavior regardless of their class, education, or diverse experiences. And today we have more emphasis on cultural differences in popular discourse in Iceland in regard to people seeking international protection or that have status as refugees, especially if they come outside the global north and are Muslims. And I often wonder when people start to talk quite negatively about cultural differences in regard to people who have sought uh, international protection in Iceland, if it's just easier to focus on cultural or so-called cultural differences instead of acknowledging the various trauma that people have experienced. And this is trauma that is often directly connected to Europe's border controls and the EU outsourcing of it to countries like Libya. And as an anthropologist, I do, of course, value diversity in terms of culture. But due to this abuse of the word culture, some anthropologists have now for some time advocated that we speak against culture in this rarefied uh, sense that it's often used. So going back to racism, it did, of course, not arrive to Iceland with increased migration, even though it was used to fit this new economic reality in the 2000s. And the, and the extensive changes going on, not only in relation to migration, but other things as well. So even though Iceland as an island in the far north appears perhaps isolated from the rest of the world, it has for a long time been part of complex dynamics of transnational connections, which racism has been an important part of. I want to stress this because an important manifestation of exceptionalism in the Nordic countries has been the image of the Nordic countries uh, as somehow not real participants in colonialism and imperialism, where the sense of exceptionalism from colonialism and thus racism has been used to refute 
the existence of racism in the present. For the last few years, we have uh, extensive research uh, showing quite clearly that the Nordic countries were not only implicit, but active participants in formation of racist ideologies, racist acts and colonialism, both in regard to uh, people outside the Nordic countries, but also internally toward the Nordic indigenous populations. Such claims of colonial innocence that help to make racist exceptionalism possible uh, are in no way limited to Iceland or the Nordic countries. Uh, Gloria Becker's phrase, to take just one example, white innocence in the context of her research in the Netherlands is one example of this. Current claims of innocence can be seen as particular forms of restitching uh, time where imperialism and colonialism are simply cut out fabrics of time, along with mobilities that were part of that history. Meaning that particular spaces are perceived as separate nation states or entities, uh, spaces which have in fact deep interconnection and shifting boundaries. And I take here as an example, mean Europe in Brussels, where it's kind of interesting to visit uh, to get uh, kind of this sense of how different uh, countries in Europe are presented in a very clear uh, way. Uh, in the 21st century, for many in the global north, the promise of modernity of stable jobs, home ownership, security and consumer goods is seen at risk or broken. And I find the concept cancellation uh, elicit quite well the sentiment of some of the ongoing processes of the 21st century, where we have a sense of intersecting crisis of different kinds, many of which are connected to different mobilities and migration. And cancellation means then the, the kind of broken promise of this modernity of people seeing uh, the, the future that they imagine to be at risk or disappearing. <coughs> so in a crisis environment of more precarious livelihood across Europe that we have today, the imagination of the past can be seen as becoming particular salient. And this is something as uh, Haki Taas has shown that Populist leaders, they have very often mobilized, drawing from ideas of mythical past, crisis during present, and utopian futures. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this uh, idea about uh, the past, the present, and the future. And this image from TAS shows uh, how this is often projection. <clears throat> but in this projection of the future, migrants are often seen as the biggest threat to the future of Europe. And it is here where the restitching of history is so important, where diversity as a part of Europe for a long time is rendered invisible. Uh, because even though TAS is mainly talking about populist re lead leaders, the restitching is not only part of hateful rhetoric toward migrants but also part of general discussion of migration, both in the media and by politicians. One of my interlocutors in a project that I did, that I mentioned earlier, focusing on the precarious migrants from this year in Belgium and Italy, pointed out in this regard, in very simple terms, why he left this year for Europe. He laughed when he said this, you see all the wealth of Nisia goes to Europe and thus I just go, I just follow the wealth to Europe. And this comment, it hints at the continued interrelationship between countries like Nisia uh, with Europe. Uh, Nisia being far from being isolated or suffering from some kind of unhistorical poverty, but has been part of a global system for a long time. Where what Anne Stoller has called runification uh, has continued since colonialism, through, for example, extraction of uranium, gold, or through Nisir's new status as particularly important for the EU border control, which has meant increased militarization for the countries 
uh, inhabitants. So just to conclude, uh, when we talk about diversity, we have to acknowledge and make visible sheer histories that have still positioned people in different ways. And while making this history visible, while making racism visible, we also have to remember as political scientist Anna Finu Guerra reminds us to ask for whom was it invisible? Because part of having privileges is precisely to be able to forget colonial history, not to see racism. And this brings me back to the verifying images of Icelandic bodies in the airport. Uh, I'm going to end on this uh, quote from a young Icelandic woman who is talking about her experience uh, as a non-white Icelanders. And then especially how the uh, tourism branding in Iceland has affected her. Uh, and as you see from the slides, she says, uh, and I'm just reading like a small part, you know, I'm from Iceland. When I say people, I'm from Iceland, the people say, no, 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 because they have this image of Iceland. That is some kind of Nordic society with no diversity or something. Thank you very much.